In the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire had reached its power peak. Within two centuries, the grandsons of Osman had transformed a local principality into a regional power, and then extended the borders of their realm over three continents. The Sublime State, as the Ottoman Empire was officially known as, ruled over large parts of the Middle East and extended its sphere of influence all the way to Tunisia in North Africa, and in Europe, Ottoman troops had reached as far as the gates of Vienna. The Sultan's rule was indirect, depending on the Sultan and the time period, meaning that local cultures were usually left untouched and deputy governors secured the power of the state. Rebellions abounded, especially in Anatolia, the Turkish heartland of the empire. Nevertheless, the conquests and the taxation of the conquered territories kept the state intact. Much more important than territorial control, however, was the Ottomans' influence on world economy. From the 15th century on, they controlled central trade routes between Asia and Europe. Valuable goods such as spices, but also textiles and even weapons, continued to be traded by merchants. There was no blockade on the part of the Ottomans, as is often claimed in history books, but certain fees that foreign merchants had to pay, for example in Egypt, in order to be allowed to travel along the routes. This also ensured the financing of the empire. But the Ottomans certainly posed a threat to the macroeconomic interests of other states and, above all, they were a thorn in the side of the Europeans. Because, apart from the usual sieges and battles between Ottomans and Habsburgs, Hungarians or Venetians at Mohawks, Vienna and Lepanto, invasions and naval battles occurred far from the usual Ottoman and European sphere of influence. Those distant wars stretched from Corsica to Italy and even to India. This series aims to raise awareness of these certainly adventurous expeditions. We are going to recount particularly important events that took place between the years 1480 and 1565. In the first episode, we deal with the Otranto Campaign, an expedition of the Ottomans to Apulia in southern Italy. By the 15th century, the Ottoman Empire was on the rise to become a world power. After more than a century of disputes with local neighbors, in which the Ottoman duchy had struggled for survival, Osman's successors were able to assert themselves even against the once powerful Byzantine Empire, and, with the conquest of Constantinople under Mehmet II, sent a signal of strength to all the other great powers in the vicinity. However, the rise to a great power was not yet sealed by conquering Constantinople, on the contrary, only now did more and more European states, apart from supposed crusaders, begin to see the Ottomans as a threat to mainland Europe. The Balkans had already been at the mercy of the Ottomans after the Battle of Kosovo in 1389 and the Ottoman victory at Varna in 1444 against numerous European states, such as Poland and Hungary, kept the defeated states from sending auxiliary soldiers to besieged Byzantium. With the conquests of Moria in the Peloponnese and the Empire of Trebizond on the Black Sea, Mehmet put an end to the last Christian strongholds of the former Byzantine Empire. In the east, interestingly, Trebizond had befriended another rising power in the Turkish world, the Ak Koyunlu, led by the legendary Uzun Hasan, grandson of the Turkmen warrior Kara Osman, and a Pontic princess, this empire challenged the Ottomans for supremacy over Anatolia. For after the Anatolian Beylik Karaman had been conquered by force under Mehmet's rule, the state of the Ak Koyunlu was the last Turkish authority standing in the way of the Ottomans in Anatolia. In the spirit of the old Beyliks, the Ak Koyunlu rode into battle towards Constantinople in 1473. After the first small initial victory on August 4, the army of Uzun Hasan was defeated in the second battle a week later at Otukbali near Erzincan. With his victory, Mehmet had secured his dominance over Anatolia, although he refrained from further ventures against Uzun Hasan. Despite massive losses, no territorial concessions were made by the Ak Koyunlu to the Ottomans. There is not even any mention of reparations by the defeated. Was there a silent agreement of mutual respect between the two Turkish rulers? In any case, Mehmet could now turn his attention back to events in the West. The Ottomans were busy in the 1470s with the resistance of a certain Skanderbeg, Iskender Bey in Turkish. The movement of this former Ottoman nobleman sparked several rebellions also in Macedonia, Greece, Kosovo, and Serbia. 
With great difficulty, Mehmet was able to put down the rebellions and annex Albania, although this was only possible because no worthy successor to Skanderbeg could be found. Mehmet had also set his sights on Moldavia. By 1480, he was sultan over an empire that stretched from Belgrade in the west to Erzurum in the east, from the Crimea in the north to Achaia in southern Greece. In the Aegean Sea, he was now fighting with Italian city-states, such as Venice, in a dispute over their trading posts and mercenary castles. But then, in the summer of 1480, an Ottoman fleet of approximately 90 galleys and two dozen transport ships set sail from Albania. Their goal, the land seizure of Apulia, a region along the Italian coast to the Adriatic Sea. It is not really clear why Mehmed gave the order for this military operation. At that time, as mentioned, he had just made peace with Venice. It's possible that he wanted to establish a base in Apulia in order to exert maritime pressure on Venice with the help of the Italian ports in case of future wars. This is the first and most plausible theory. However, that region was then in the hands of the Kingdom of Naples. And there is a theory that Mehmet could have simply responded to a call for help from the Emirate of Granada, which was under attack from the Spanish the campaign to Otranto may have been a diversionary tactic to force the Spanish into a two-front war and soften the pressure on Granada. The third and most interesting theory is that Mehmet intended a serious conquest of Italy and wanted to penetrate as far as Rome. The constant counterattacks of the Christian kingdoms were eventually supported by Rome and the Papal States. Having snatched Constantinople from Christian hands, the conquest of the real heart of ancient Rome would have truly been a prestigious victory for the Ottomans. This was a goal that even the Arabs had not achieved during the Umayyad and Abbasid periods. And, just as the Arabs had once at least ruled Sicily and southern Italy for a while, trying to penetrate further into Italy, the Ottomans were now going to try to do the same with Apulia. The 110-ship strong fleet was led by Gedik Ahmed Pasha. This admiral was in command of about 20,000 men. Some sources even assume 100,000 men as the size of the Ottoman expeditionary force, but it is questionable how so many soldiers, including their armor and provisions, could have been accommodated on 20 transport ships. In any case, Gedik Pasha's troops landed in Apulia on July 28. Many Ottoman soldiers present had taken part in the siege of Rhodes shortly before. The troops advanced to Otranto, now a small port city of 6,000 inhabitants. The so-called Strait of Otranto is the strait between southern Italy and Albania, and thus of strategic importance for the domination of the eastern Mediterranean. The soldiers and civilians of Otranto fled to a nearby castle that was then besieged by the Ottomans. After two weeks, the invaders managed to get in. The Ottoman troops, according to Christian sources, purged one street after another, looted and set fire to the houses. When the Ottomans arrived at the cathedral, they found Archbishop Stefano Pendinelli, who had retreated here with all the priests of the city, as well as many civilians. The Ottomans had him executed and, allegedly, had the church bells of the cathedral melted down to make weapons. Nearly 800 members of the church, who were apparently forced by the Ottomans to convert from Christianity to Islam, refused. They were then beheaded at Minerva Hill on August 14. In 2013, the Catholic Church recognized these 800 men as martyrs within the church's own historical canon. However, contemporary historians believe that the Ottomans did not intend to spread their Islamic faith, but perpetrated the massacres to both deter any resistance and punish those who would not surrender a practice that was commonplace all over the world, from England to Korea, regardless of culture and religion. In any case, Otranto now belonged to the sphere of Ottoman rule. During the late summer, the Ottoman fleet of 70 ships carried out several attacks along the coastal towns of Vieste, Lecce, and Brindisi. However, the Ottomans were getting into trouble. This was because further action into the interior of Italy was conditional on sufficient supplies for the soldiers. But so far, no more supplies were coming from the Ottoman mainland, and the straits were dangerous due to the risk of enemy incursions. Therefore, Gedik Pasha withdrew a large part of his army and sailed back to the port in Albania. He left behind a small army of 500 cavalrymen and 800 infantry with the order to hold Otranto. Presumably, he intended to return in the winter with a reinforced army. But this did not happen. The Ottoman garrison was left alone. 
and Christian Europe in turn was already planning a reconquest in favor of Naples. In April 1481, Pope Sixtus VI called for a crusade to Otranto. King Ferdinand of Naples, his son Alfonso, and King Matthias Corvinus of Hungary, among others, joined the crusade. A contingent of several thousand soldiers from Italy and Hungary besieged Otranto. Of the original 20,000 inhabitants of the city, only 8,000 were left by now, as many survivors had fled the region for fear of a prolonged war. In May 1481, the Europeans launched the siege, but they failed in taking the city, although King Ferdinand had even received help from his cousin and King of Sicily, who was also named Ferdinand. The Ottoman garrison was able to hold out until September 1481. Nevertheless, they could no longer maintain the occupation of Otranto, not because of the besieging army, but because of a domestic event. Mehmet II, who had been bestowed the honorary title the Conqueror, had lost his life on May 3rd, shortly after the beginning of the siege. And shortly before his death, he had actually planned a personal expedition to Otranto. But his demise, as so often in Turkish history, triggered a struggle for the succession to the throne, so that the Ottoman generals and admirals considered it advisable to withdraw the garrison in Apulia. The supply of troops would simply not have been given. Moreover, Gedik Ahmed Pasha, the man responsible for the campaign, had risen to become regent of the Ottoman Empire. He supported the ascension of Bayezid II and fought with the young prince against his brother Sem Sultan for power in the empire. However, due to a mishap, Bayezid lost confidence in Gedik Pasha and had him assassinated a year later. After laborious negotiations with the Christian defenders, many of the Ottoman troops were allowed to leave Otranto unharmed by ship for Albania. But several hundred of them were actually captured and enslaved by the Neapolitan army that entered the city on September 10. Thus, the Ottomans' rule in Apulia, which lasted for about one year, came to an end. The consequences of the Siege of Otranto for Roman Catholic historiography are well known, but geopolitically, the loss of the port meant a setback for the Ottoman Empire. In any case, a conquest of Rome had become a distant prospect, for the expedition had revealed the logistical problems of an overseas offensive. The Ottomans had had to abandon the city without a real defeat. Nevertheless, this event shows the ambition that the Ottoman rulers cultivated. Mehmet had truly earned the title of the Conqueror, not because of the conquest of Constantinople, but of his wars along three different fronts. Imagine how events in Apulia would have turned out had Mehmet personally arrived to save the garrison. Now, his son Bayezid became the next sultan of the empire. Like his father, the 34-year-old continued to cultivate this expansionist mentality. His focus was on consolidating and centralizing the empire along its borders. But during Bayezid's three-decade-long reign, Ottoman admirals, sailors, and soldiers also took detours to remote and seemingly unreachable places. This time, the Ottomans turned their heads to the east. Their next destination was India. However, the Portuguese, who had entered Otranto only after the Ottomans had already left, were on the path to domination along the trade hubs of South Asia. In the process, they came into conflict with the Gujarat Sultanate, which had called upon the Muslim world for help against the intruders. To protect the incoming goods from Asia from Portuguese influence, both the Ottoman Empire and the Mamluk Sultanate sent ships and troops to the city of Diu. Here, one of the most important naval battles in history would soon take place. If you like this video and would like to know more about Turkic history, consider leaving a comment and subscribing to this channel. Thanks, and see you around.